Well, hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, notably, it is the last day of American Heart Month and it's Leap Day. So we get an extra day of American Heart Month here. Um, and we are so pleased to have you joining us for today's webinar, Getting at the Heart of Needs in Women's Heart Health. My name is Katie Schubert. I'm president and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research, or SWHR. And for those of you who might be new to us, SWHR is a more than 30-year-old national nonprofit dedicated to advancing women's health through science, policy, and education while promoting sex differences to optimize women's health. And we are, again, excited for today's webinar. We're going to provide an overview of heart disease in women including the scope of the problem and the disparities women face in research and care. And we'll walk through two of SWHR's newest resources focused on heart health, our heart health policy agenda, as well as a call to action focused on ischemic heart disease. Um, so as we get started here, I'd like to thank the sponsors of SWHR's Heart Health Policy Program, Amgen and Novartis, whose support has made this event possible. Um, and before we pivot to today's program, let me just go through a few housekeeping notes. So note that we are recording today's webinar. We will be posting it online and sharing it with everyone who has registered. Time permitting, we'll ask questions at the end of today's event following the panelists' presentations. And to ask a question, we would love for you to use the Zoom Q&A function. Um, you can use the chat function. It's just a little bit tougher for us to track those. So just keep that in mind as well. And if you need technical assistance, that's when you can use that chat fun function. Um, and note that we do have limited uh, technical assistance available while the webinar is running. So. With all of that said, let me introduce today's um, amazing panelists. Dr. Martha Gulati serves as a professor of cardiology and the director of cardiovascular diseases prevention at the Cedar sinai Heart Institute and is the associate director of the Barbara Streisand Women's Heart Center. She holds the Anita Dan Friedman Endowed Chair in Women's Cardiovascular Medicine and Research and is the president of the American Society for Preventive Cardiology. Previously, she was a professor of medicine and the inaugural chief of cardiology at the University of Arizona and is also the author of the bestseller, Saving Women's Heart. Lindsay Miltenberger is the Chief Advocacy Officer here at SWHR, where she provides oversight of SWHR's government relations, communications, and advocacy functions. Um, as a member of SWHR's senior team, she's responsible for helping to drive SWHR's policy agenda, build relationships with key stakeholders and policymakers, and guide activities to improve women's health through science policy and education. And then finally, we have Catherine Palmer, who is SWHR's Science Policy Fellow. And as the Science Policy Fellow, she supports the Women's Health Dashboard by exploring research, care, and policy gaps in the United States related to ischemic heart disease in women. She's currently a student at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, earning her Master of Public Health degree in Infectious Disease Epidemiology. And we are really delighted to um, give her the opportunity to share what she's been working on and taking the lead on here at SWHR as well. So with that, uh, Dr. Gulati, I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you also for uh, making heart health a priority because I think obviously it is the leading killer of women and we need to pay more attention to it than we do. We get the shortest month of the year every year. This year we get a bonus day, but usually we only get 28 days. So I'm going to go over why it's such a, a big problem. Um, and, and so let's just get started here. So, you know, the most important thing is, is that women's health has always come second to men. And just like everything in society, it's accentuated in medicine. The things that differ between men and women really get accentuated when we talk about medicine. Today, I'm going to try to talk about, you know, the fact that women are not small men. And there's some differences due to the, in their heart health, either due to gender which is a social construct, but some are due to sex, to the biology. And it's important for us to know which ones are which, but we haven't really studied women. So I'm gonna talk also a little bit um, about where are the women. So in the United States, based on our last assessment of the 1.3 million deaths of American women, over 400,000 of their deaths are due to cardiovascular disease. This makes it the leading killer of women. 
Chronic lung disease is actually the second leading cause and lung cancer is the third leading cause. Breast cancer is in fact the fourth leading cause of women accounting for about 42,000 deaths. So you can see that you have a tenfold greater risk of dying from cardiovascular disease as a woman than breast cancer. But what do our patients really understand or know? They know to get their breast screen. They don't understand their risk for heart disease. When we talk about the prevalence of cardiovascular disease in American women, again, 60 million women live with some form of cardiovascular disease. Breast cancer, about 4 million women live with breast cancer. It's not to minimize breast cancer. Of course, that's an important issue, but it just to emphasize the fact that their awareness about heart disease is significantly less despite the fact that it is the leading killer. <laughs> Why is this? Well, Dr. Nanette Wanger, who I would consider the mother of women and heart disease, she said this many years ago. In fact, she said this when I was in medical school. She said the medical community viewed women's health with a bikini approach, essentially looking at the breasts and the reproductive system and almost ignoring the rest of a woman when we talk about women's health. Like I said, she said that more than two decades ago when I'm still writing editorials really quoting her, asking, you know, when are we moving beyond the bikini? When are we actually going to really study and protect women's hearts? So I'm gonna show you a few things just to understand a little bit more about women. And I want you to ask yourself when I'm showing you these examples, is it sex or is it gender? Gender is a social construct. It's how we're seen by society. And so if we're seen as women, we may get less good care or we may get better care. Depends how we're viewed, right? Um, but though that's because of our gender. Whereas biology or our sex, our sex really affects every cell. Every cell has a sex. Every gene and every molecule is influenced by our biological sex. So how we respond to medications, how, you know, the type of hormonal milieu we live in, the ability to get pregnant, of course, is something only that can happen to biological women. So there's, both of these are important because both influence our overall health. But I'm going to use an example of something called an acute myocardial infarction or a heart attack. That's the layperson term. Because we collect a lot of public data on, on heart attacks. That way we can keep track. How good are we doing? Are there places to improve our care? And we also look at things by, by sex and by race. And we try to determine, you know, where do some people get better care than others? Well, what we do know is that women get less guideline-directed care compared with men when they're having a heart attack. Just a few examples. Most places, if we have a cath lab, we would take a heart attack right to the cath lab. We know women are taken less frequently. And something that we call the door to balloon time, how quickly we open up that artery from the minute someone hits the door to opening up that artery, we actually measure that time, but it's always longer for women than for men. At places that are unable to do that procedure, they might give something called fibrolytics. And again, we, we measure something called the door to needle time. Again, longer for women. We also assess who gets guideline-directed medical therapy, those life-saving drugs that can be the difference between being alive or not surviving a heart attack. And when we look, whether it's 24 hours or upon discharge after the heart attack, women are less likely to receive guideline-directed therapies. And we also see that there's more readmissions ultimately in women. Well, it shouldn't be surprising by just me telling you those things that women are more likely to die than men. That's the only thing we do better than men is die, particularly the more severe type of a heart attack called an ST elevation myocardial infarction. And also our younger women, women under the age of 55, if they're unfortunate enough to experience a heart attack, they have the highest mortality rate. And we know this isn't a US problem, this is a global problem. And so this is something that we are all looking at because we really know from all the data that um, every country has this problem. 
Just some examples, you know, when women present with chest pain to the emergency room, they get less timely care. This study looked at the National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey. This represented 29 million emergency department visits of people under the age of 55. So young adults under the age of 55. And they found that women were less likely to be triaged as an emergent case. They waited about 10 minutes longer to be evaluated. They were less likely to get an EKG or any type of cardiac monitoring. They were less likely to be seen by a cardiologist and they were less likely to be admitted to the hospital. These similar findings were seen in people of color. So I would argue this isn't about our biological sex. This is about how we're seen by society. This is a gender gap. We have other examples of gaps in our care. When we make a diagnosis of somebody having some form of cardiovascular disease, in general, most people will need a high intensity statin therapy. That's just part of our guideline directed therapy. Well, this, this particular study looked at it. What was the odds of getting a statin? And then what was the odds of getting on that high dose statin? You can see that we don't do well in getting anyone on statins. Almost half the people aren't on statins. But though ultimately only about a quarter get on high intensity statin, but the odds of getting on that high dose statin was much greater if you were a man than if you were a woman. We know for those under the age of 55, again, the younger people with the most to lose, that again, we don't give guideline directed therapies. This is after a heart attack, lipid lowering agents, antiplatelet agents, beta blockers. These are considered life-saving therapies that we should give to everyone after a heart attack, but women are less likely to get them compared with men. And our sickest women are less likely to get the most aggressive therapy. So we, when somebody has a heart attack and they present in cardiogenic shock, many of these patients are going to die, male or female. We should be pulling out all the stops to try to take care of these patients. But this particular study showed that women were less likely to get revascularization or circulatory support, and women were more likely to die. And again, we saw racial differences too. It was worse if you were Black or Hispanic. So we can use other examples. I could keep going on. I'll probably bore you, but I, I, you know, people with heart failure, we know women are less likely to get guideline-directed medical therapy. This study just looked at getting one of our guideline-directed medical therapy at the U.S. veteran hospitals, and they showed that within 30 days, only 22% of women compared to 37% of men got at least one guideline-directed medical therapy, and out at one year, it got better, but it still wasn't great. 40% of women compared to 62% of men. So why is this bias in our care? And I could show you so many examples in my cardiology world that shows these differences. So TAVR is a way that we can replace the aortic valve without open heart surgery. And the early studies showed women actually did better than men with this procedure, which was really fortunate because with surgery, they didn't do as well. But guess what? Now that it's standard of care, we don't offer it to women as often as we do to men. Atrial fibrillation is something we see very commonly and it, it increases as we age. The risk of atrial fibrillation is really the risk of stroke. And yet women are less likely to get adequate anticoagulation when they have atrial fibrillation, which is what they should get so that we reduce the risk of stroke. They are less likely to be offered ablation procedures to try to get rid of it altogether. We use these devices, these defibrillator devices specifically, there's one that it works best in women if they need it. And yet again, in terms of our utilization of it, women are less likely to get it, even though women do better with it. And heart transplants, again, only represent about a quarter uh, only a quarter of the population that gets transplants is women. And so again, there's a lot of other barriers, but these are pretty pronounced that women are less likely to get the heart transplants too when they need them. There's a lot of differences though, also about sex. You know, I don't have a lot of time to get into them, but the type of 
disease we see is different in women compared to men. When women do have heart attacks, they're less likely to have those clogged arteries or blocked arteries. And we know that what we call non-obstructive coronary disease is more frequently seen in women and probably because the disease is in the smaller blood vessels. And so some of the work that we've done, the Earl, this is old work of mine, where we actually showed that those not having a blockage didn't mean you weren't at risk for heart disease compared to normal women. And um, that's just one example. Maybe many of you might know this disease called Takasubo syndrome, also known as broken heart syndrome. Um, this, this is, you know, often seen in women more than men that the brain heart connection is there when women, uh, specifically get some exciting news or bad news, they can sometimes suddenly have a heart attack and we don't know why women get it more than men, but it definitely is uh, nine for every 10 events that occur. Nine of them occur in women compared to one man. It happens very frequently in postmenopausal women. And despite people thinking that it's benign, it actually is not. I mean, there's there's at least a 5% in hospital mortality and about 20% of people will have persistent changes to their heart function. We don't know why certain people get it a subsequent event we can't even predict it and that's because we've just started really studying it and we don't even know how best to treat it nor do we know how best to treat those who get recurrences we call it takasubos because there's a you can see the drawing in the middle here that that takasubo is a shape that the heart gets disordered distorted to and it it's the way that people in japan catch the octopus they use it's called a takasubos and so it looks very much like that but again we call often call it broken heart syndrome can be another name that you might hear about it again a disease that we need to know more about Risk factors are also different in women compared to men that I think are underappreciated. If you have diabetes as a woman, you have a greater risk of developing heart disease. Hypertension, even the blood pressure thresholds that we have, perhaps they shouldn't be the same for men and women. And there's work going on to really determine that right now. We know sometimes even in cholesterol, especially something called LP little a, changes in women. Women after menopause, that number changes. For most men, it stays consistent throughout their life. These diseases of inflammation, like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, occur more frequently in women and are strongly associated with heart disease. And so there's a lot of things that are different for women than they are for men. Another unique risk factor for her, for that can, is only there for biological women is the fact that biological women are the only ones that can get pregnant. And pregnancy to me is effectively a free stress test. It tells us if somebody in their future is gonna develop heart disease, if they develop conditions like hypertension during pregnancy, pre eclampsia, gestational diabetes, preterm delivery, a small for gestational age baby. All of those conditions increase the risk for the future risk of heart disease. And this is just sort of a summary of that. We know 80% of American women bear at least one child and those adverse pregnancy outcomes, though those things that I had just listed occur in about 10 to 20% of pregnancies. That's not infrequent, but often women don't get asked about those risk factors when they're trying to identify if this woman might be at risk for heart disease. So we've coined the four, this term called the fourth trimester to really to say that after women are pregnant, that we need to be identifying these women who are at risk so that we can do a better job of preventing long-term consequences, the long-term risks of those adverse pregnancy outcomes. There's a lot of other unique risk factors for women that I don't have enough time to talk about, but things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, age of menarche, premature menopause. And when I see women, I try to identify which risk factors are present so that I can put together a better picture of who is actually at risk. So now in the last few minutes, I wanted to just spend some time though talking about why we don't have a lot of data on women. And the biggest thing is, is we haven't included women in so many of our cardiovascular trials. 
This is why we have a lot of work to do. This was an editorial written by the first woman to head up the National Institute of Health in the United States. She happened to be a cardiologist and happened to be one of my heroes, Dr. Bernadine Healy. And she wrote this wonderful analogy of the story of Yentl to say the Yentl syndrome. You might know the story of Yentl. Yentl, it's a movie and a book. And um, Barbara Streisand starred in the movie. But the in the book, Yentl wants to dis has to disguise herself as a man in order to study the Talmud because back in that day, women could not study the Talmud. So, Dr. Rahili used this example because she said, "Do women have to look like men in order to be taken seriously? Do they have to present just like men? Is there no other way that we're going to identify them?" And she pushed to get women to be included into trials. And that was the beginning, but certainly not the end, because you can see even more recent data. This is from 2020, where they looked at how woman representation in clinical trials. And this particular study, study sorry, looked at global enrollment of women. And really for almost every cardiovascular disease, we don't enroll enough women. The only disease state we do is something called pulmonary hypertension, which disproportionately affects women. So of course there they over-enroll women, but all the common disorders, we don't enroll women. It doesn't matter if it's a drug, device, lifestyle intervention, not enough women. It doesn't matter where the study's done all over the world, we don't enroll enough women. It doesn't matter if it's a large study or a small study, we don't get enough women. We're getting better at getting women under the age of 55 into our trials, but over the age of 55, we don't do a good job. And because the disease tends to affect us more frequently as we age, this is a huge issue. And then even sponsor type doesn't matter. But one thing I will say, when the government is involved in trials, we get less women. And that means that there's no accountability when we're using government funding. And then this isn't unique to the US. Again, remember, this is a global analysis. And don't even get me started about pregnant women because we don't really study pregnant women, sadly. And that means we're never going to advance or understand pregnancy and the drugs we might need to use in that state. But so we do have a lot of work to do, but I will tell you part of the reason that we don't have women in trials has to do with our history. Let's go back to the 1960s. Some of you might remember a drug called thalidomide. It was used in Europe for morning sickness and had devastating consequences to the offspring. So almost overnight, because that drug wasn't studied and just used, um, the FDA said, you know what, women of childbearing potential is are not going to be included in trials. Then in the 80s, you know, the um, FDA recognized certain subgroups needed to be studied, but guess what? They left out anything about race and sex. The NIH, though, did say that women should be included in studies. It was not a very strong recommendation, but it was a recommendation nonetheless. In the 1990s, that's when Dr. Healy headed up the NIH, and that's when the FDA finally removed the restriction for participation of women of childbearing potential. It was also when the Office of Women's Health Research was established, and it also was when the Congress actually mandated the inclusion of women in trials. Again, they mandated it, but they didn't make anybody be accountable. So in the 2000s, you know, the FDA decided we're not going to do studies on pregnant women. So let's have some exposure registries. That's good. We can learn things from that. In the 2010, you know, it wasn't until actually 2016 when the NIH finally mandated our preclinical studies, our cell studies, our animal studies to include both male and female lines. So whether we're talking mice models or cell lines, guess what? They were all being done on male lines. We're not, that's, you, you learn from preclinical studies before you go clinical, but we won't learn about women if we don't include the female lines. And it wasn't until 2022 when the FDA finally said that for devices, people have to report sex and gender. It was also in 2022 when the Institute of Medicine said that, you know, we need to have inclusion in our trials. We need women and people from diverse backgrounds in our trials. So I just hope that just tells you why we are where we are right now.
And you can even see from the FDA of new drug studies that go up to the FDA, this yellow line is cardiac drugs. All the other lines are different uh, areas. Everyone's doing better at getting uh, women into the trials, except for cardiology. The leading killer, again, we said is of women, is women, uh, oh, sorry, the leading killer of women is cardiovascular disease. And we don't get represented in trials. So we have a ways to go. So how will we improve women's health? Well, like I said, we need women to be in trials. We need more diversity in our trials. We need to apply our guidelines equally so that women get their life-saving treatments. We need to talk about bias and get rid of bias in our clinical care because it does affect outcomes. Women's heart centers can help. I think I've been a big proponent of building women's heart centers because it really does change outcomes. And we need to continue to follow our metrics globally so that we can really hold ourselves accountable and make the changes that need to be changed. And that's how we're gonna improve the health of women. So I think in the future, we need to talk about you know, AI and how it can improve care and how it can remove bias. Uh, you know, we need to get our guidelines applied equally, but mostly I think if I, you know, we need to get studies of women, we as women need to participate in trials because when we look for sex differences, we often find them. I think that our government is recognizing this. We had the pleasure of having Jill Biden with us a few weeks ago, and now she just made the announcement that the White House is going to fund over a hundred million dollars is going to be funneled into women's health. It's not just cardiovascular health, but she started with us to learn about the heart and why we needed funding there. So thank you again, and I hope there'll be time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gulati. I think this is my third time listening to you, and I feel like I learned something each time I hear you Present. So thank you so much for that comprehensive overview. Um, we will now go into our next portion of the agenda. And I'm absolutely thrilled today to get to share with you SWHR's newest heart health resource, our heart health policy agenda. And before I walk through the policy agenda and its components, I do want to give some background on this document and talk a little bit about how SWHR approaches its various programs throughout the year. So our heart health program kicked off with an interdisciplinary roundtable in the fall of 2023. This roundtable brought together researchers, clinicians, policy experts, and patient advocates to talk about the needs and opportunities in women's heart health, and specifically how we could tackle some of those opportunities through policy. Um, some additional elements of the program beyond the policy agenda, which were all grounded in insights that were gleaned during that interdisciplinary roundtable, have included a patient experiences webinar called On My Heart, Women Share Personal Journeys with Heart Disease, which was co-hosted with Women Heart, the National Coalition for Women with Heart Disease, a one-pager on challenges of management in heart disease for women, um, so some of those things included Mr. Delayed Diagnosis, Education and Awareness Needs, and some insurance protocol challenges. And then a campaign called hashtag read my lips, which is a cute play on read my lipids, which was really a campaign centered on educating women about understanding their personal risk for cardiovascular disease and empowering women to take charge of their heart health through steps like um, knowing your cholesterol level through a lipid panel test. We also continue to engage in policy throughout the year. So we have been supporting efforts around the resolution designating September as National Cholesterol Education Month and September 30th as LDLC Awareness Day, um, but also keeping an ear to the ground for other opportunities to shape women's heart health throughout the year. Next slide, please. And speaking of our Heart Health Policy Working Group, I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge the esteemed members of that working group. Their names are also listed in the policy agenda and on our website. And I do want to note that these individuals are really the heroes of the heart health policy world. SWHR is so grateful for their partnership and for them contributing their time and their expertise um, to this program. Next slide, please. So moving into the policy agenda itself, 
Again, this document was informed by our Heart Health Policy Working Group, but I do want to make a note, a disclaimer at the outset that the final represent, recommendations represent those of SWHR and do not necessarily reflect the recommendations of our working group participants. So the Heart Health Policy Agenda is really intended to serve as a roadmap for policymakers to address some of the gaps that exist within women's heart health. And it does that by focusing on five kind of overarching areas, which are education, awareness, and advocacy, research needs, clinical care opportunities, coverage and access, and prevention. Next slide, please. So what's actually included in the agenda? As, we, as I mentioned, we broke out the agenda into these five overarching sections. Each section has high level recommendations, which is what you see listed here, but then it goes into some um, specific policy recommendations that are kind of, um, that fall within each of these broader recommendations. So under education and awareness and advocacy, obviously raising awareness is key. Um, only 44% of women recognize heart disease as the number one killer of U.S. women annually. So we recommend really conducting a federally led national public awareness campaign. Um, we know that that is not a new recommendation. This has been done before, but some of the comments that came from our working group are that a national public awareness campaign needs to be culturally sensitive, that it's distilled down into just a few simple measures that people can take so it doesn't feel quite so overwhelming or quite so broad. And it also needs to include diverse representation, both in imagery and messaging. Um, we also learned during the round table, and you heard it in Dr. Gulati's presentation just now, that guideline-directed therapies aren't always applied equally to men and women. Women are often undertreated compared to their male, male counterparts, and we need to address that gap. On the research side, we have to increase diversity across all levels of science. Again, this is something you heard in Dr. Gulati's presentation, but this spans from research participants to research leadership. So we have recommendations in this space that call out a few pieces of legislation, some that have been introduced this Congress already, some that have not yet been introduced that we think could make a difference in improving representation in clinical trials. So things like the DIVERSE Act and the NIH Clinical Trials Diversity Act. We also broadly talk about the need for more funding in women's heart health research, including research in, into some of the most common forms of heart disease, including heart failure and coronary artery disease, both of which have historically not had sufficient representation of women. And then finally, within this section, we noted the need to prioritize the NIH policy on sex as a biological variable, which laid out NIX NIH's expectation that sex and that sex differences be accounted for in research analyses and reporting, and that we need to better integrate sex as a biological variable across the biomedical research enterprise so that we're making sure we're accounting for sex differences in research and that we're holding research entities accountable for making sure that those sex differences are reported. And then under the clinical care opportunities side, this was obviously a big area of discussion. One big point of focus was the need to rectify training in medical education so that students are taught about sex and gender differences in medicine and in healthcare. There also need to be tailored risk models to account for the biological and physiological differences between males and females. Another point that was raised during the roundtable that we included is that often within clinical guidelines, women's specific information is included as a special patient group and is not integrated throughout the guidelines themselves. So it almost can be seen kind of as an afterthought. And so working group members raised that integrating women throughout those guidelines could be helpful. And then last but not least, patients must be at the center of their healthcare plan. Next slide, please. Under coverage and access, we spent quite a bit of time talking about utilization management policies and the impact that they can have on treatment for cardiovascular patients. Some of the specific recommendations within this space include passing the Safe Step Act, which places reasonable limits on the use of step therapy, as well as passing the Improving Seniors Timely Access to Care Act provisions. Um, so we included, you know, step therapy, prior authorization, non-medical switching are all listed within the agenda itself. Also in this category, we talk about expanding the telehealth flexibilities that were implemented during the COVID-19 pandemic 
so that patients can more easily, easily utilize telemedicine. So one of the specific actions that was raised in this section was passing the Connect for Health Act, which would expand access to telehealth services and take steps like permanently removing geographic requirements for telehealth services. And then under the prevention section, um, this section really called attention to the fact that prevention is among the most helpful tools available to reduce the burden of heart disease and improve outcomes. Uh, in fact, research shows that an estimated 80% of cardiovascular disease cases may be preventable through addressing modifiable risk factors like diet, exercise, tobacco, and alcohol use. So getting at these issues from a policy perspective requires getting at some of the root causes of heart disease. So policies proposed in this prevention section include protecting programs like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, supporting community-based interventions that involve clinical and community integration, integrating wellness principles into medical school curriculum, and focusing on behavioral health change. And again, the policy agenda will go into more detail than I'm going into now, but that just gives you a sense of some of what we covered in the heart health policy agenda. And with that, I will pause and turn it over to my colleague, Katie, who will walk through another one of SWHR's new heart health policy resources, a call to action related to ischemic heart disease. So Katie, I will turn it to you. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so in an effort to highlight and address disparities in women's health across the lifespan, the SWHR has launched the Women's Health Dashboard. And this dashboard serves as a resource and centralized platform for SWHR and other stakeholders in women's health to explore the latest national and state data on five specific diseases that have significant impacts on women's health, including ischemic heart disease or IHD. And IHD refers to the reduced flow of blood and oxygen to the heart, and the dashboard is specifically focusing on IHD because it is a leading cause of death for women over 50 and was identified as having a high disease burden on women. And so kind of in conjunction with the data that you can find on the dashboard, SWHR has also been developing calls to action for each of the disease areas. And these calls to action are developed based on data from the dashboard, but also a review of the literature to identify research gaps and provide some policy recommendations. Next slide, please. So earlier this month, SWHR published a lifespan approach to addressing IHD in women. Um, and despite the prevalence of heart disease and its history as a leading cause of death, gaps in research and knowledge still exist as Dr. Gulati kind of went through. Um, and so to address some of these overall gaps, in our understanding of IHD in women, the report is calling out the need for inclusive and updated research studies to advance the knowledge of IHD in women. Um, also the need for preventions and interventions that are specifically tailored to women and working to address disparities in care that both women face compared to men, but also that exist for women in color, women of color. Next slide. Um, and the report then takes this a little bit further and looks at addressing gaps and disparities across the lifespan as it pertains to IHD in young women, menopause, and pregnancy, which I'll now go through a little further. So next slide, please. Um, so young women 35 to 54 are emerging as an at-risk population for heart disease. And while we may not traditionally think of ages 35 to 54, when we think of young women, if you think about the fact that heart disease is typically associated with women in their 70s or older, this group of women 35 to 54 really are young to be experiencing heart disease. And so um, when we talk about young women and heart disease, we're really talking about 35 to 54 as it is defined in the literature. Um, and so not only are young women clinically emerging as an at-risk population, but a 2019 study found that women were 64% less likely than in 2009 to know that heart disease was the leading cause of death for women. And this number was even higher among the youngest ages surveyed as well as women of color. And so kind of based on this decline in awareness and these emerging specific clinical manifestations of IHD, the report calls out the need to prioritize research focused on understanding the clinical presentations of IHD in young women, the need to promote public awareness of heart disease risks and prevention specifically for young women, and to increase provider awareness about engaging young women in heart health conversations earlier so that they can participate in prevention measures. Next slide, please. 
Um, so the report then also goes into IHD and menopause. And menopause has long been associated with an increased risk in IHD, and often this association has been linked to the changes in estrogen that occur during menopause. However, this association has not been studied robustly, and there are other symptoms of menopause, such as depression, sleep disturbances, weight redistribution, and more that are independently associated with IHD that could also be playing a role in this increased risk that is seen. And so due in part to the lack of clarity surrounding this increased risk of IHD, the report calls out the need to identify the mechanisms that are increasing risk of IHD after menopause and prioritizing research to identify prevention and intervention strategies for postmenopausal women. It also calls out the need to elucidate the role of hormone replacement therapy in the prevention of IHD. Um, this is partially because HRT has been has a history of being a little controversial in prevention of ischemic heart disease, um, going back to some findings from the Women's Health Initiative that emerged in the early 2000s, indicating an absence of cardiovascular benefit to women on HRT and an increase of other diseases. However, um, there were some limitations to the study that to this study, including that the women in this study, most of them were over a decade past their last menstrual cycle and only one formulation of HRT was studied. And so more recently, some reanalysis of this Women's Health Initiative data by age um, and some more recent studies have demonstrated that HRT may be beneficial when administered early and to women under 60. And so kind of because of this muddy role that HRT may or may not be able to play in prevention of heart disease, we're highlighting the need to really tease that out and understand how HRT could be prevention. Next slide, please. And lastly, the report discusses pregnancy and ischemic heart disease. And so, as we saw earlier, both pregnancy and adverse pregnancy outcomes, such as gestational diabetes and preeclampsia, are emerging as risk factors for IHD later in life. Um, however, pregnant persons are often left out of research studies and risk assessments. And so, this has the potential to be even more pressing as maternal age rises in the US and young women are emerging as an at-risk population. And so the report highlights the need to investigate how pregnancy and adverse pregnancy outcomes are altering the risk of IHD, the need to incorporate parity and history of APOs into risk assessments and interventions for IHD, and to educate providers on the role of pregnancy and APOs in IHD risks so that they can also be having these conversations with their patients. Um, and so if you wanna learn anything more about either of these stages of the lifespan or these calls to action, you can read the report on our website. Next slide. Um, so now I think we'll go into questions for myself and all of the panelists. Thank you so much, Katie. And I know we are very quickly coming to the end of our webinar. I think maybe we have time for one question. I saw um, one come through the chat that Dr. Gulati, maybe um, I would like to turn to you. And it's how do how do women who want to participate in clinical trials locate clinical trials? We um, clinicaltrials.gov was mentioned as a good place to start, but um, how else can clinical trials be located? Yeah, clinicaltrials.gov lists every trial going on. Your local hospitals will also have their own sites, so it's kind of hard to list them all. Um, but, you know, the best way is if you know that they have a trial center in the hospital near where you live, you can always call and say, is there any trials that I would be eligible for? But starting to search depending on if you have a certain condition, sometimes also societies, um, like for example, the FH uh, foundation will be like, if you know you have that disorder, you might be able to go there as well. There is a way to be also the American Heart Association actually has a, a Go Red for Women site um, that you know, we just want to know what your knowledge is and your awareness is. And so anyone can be part of that by just literally going to the go red uh, for women.org, I think is the website. And you can um, enter your information and be part of a big data set that we're also looking at. Thank you. And I did see that um, the link for the go red for women site was dropped in the chat. Um, 
So I do want to be respectful of our panelists' time. We only had 45 minutes today, which went by so quickly. But um, please stay connected with us. If you have questions, um, feel free to reach out to members of the SWHR team following this webinar. We'll also be sharing the resources that were mentioned during the event in a follow-up email to our registrants. And then please stay connected with SWHR more generally. Um, we've listed our website along with our many social media channels here on, um, on this page. But we touch on women's health across the lifespan. So heart health is obviously, um, you know, a huge part of that. But we also have programs in autoimmune disease and conditions and bone health and menopause and narcolepsy and other sleep um, sleep issues. So um, please stay engaged with us throughout the year. We would love, um, love to have you involved. Thank you all so much for tuning into the webinar today. And again, thank you to our panelists um, for sharing their time with us. Um, please let us know if you have any questions and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Goodbye. Thanks so much.